So maybe you're with a friend, and so you have your friend. You take the air filter off, and then one of you, you get a little gas, and one of you uh, is in the car, and you pour some some gas in the carburetor, and then you have your friend turn it, pump it, yeah. And then uh, if it doesn't go, you pour, pour maybe a little gas more in there, and then you keep doing it, and then it fires up. Yeah? And now the car's running. If you stop pouring gas in, yeah. The gas did its job. It was just sort of to initiate the firing. It needed a little oomph to start. It's not what drives it. It's just needed a little oomph. If you pour, keep pouring the gas in, it, uh, it will flood it. Yeah, that's sort of how I feel about this invitation and this message. Uh, to me, it's like a spiritual subpoena. You know, you get served it, uh, and then it does its thing because. The message is just a catalyst. It's not the message. The mind is the message. What receives the message, what entertains the message, is the message. And this message is just a, sort of like a, a crutch or a catalyst or a, you know how they have a, sometimes they have these things, you have a vitamin and you need a nutrition, but you can't get into the body system just by itself. They, so they put it on the back of something else that the body recognizes and breaks down when it breaks that down, then the, the nutrition gets in. The body would say no to it if it just came in the nutrition form, yeah? So they put it on some, I don't know what they call it, but it sort of it piggybacks on a, a system that the, uh, something that the system can break down easily. So this is just piggybacking on a concept, you know, language. We're using words, yeah, to get into the mail slot of the mind, the conditional mind. And the mail slot is a conceptual mail slot. Now, the message isn't the words. So when the mind reads the invitation, it may read the words, but it's when the, em- the envelope opens up, there's nothing in it. That's the message. So hopefully the message causes the reader of the message to question or to feel the reader, not the message. Yeah? The emphasis is on not the message. Because... If it is on the message, it'll become another message in a long line of messages. There's tons of messages, yeah. Tons of messages, and then there's the message, and then they turbocharge the message, or they extremely radicalize the message, but this is the message. But the mind is it, yeah? The mind is what gives meaning. The mind is what changes the meaning of the book you read. You read it five years ago, and then you read it now, and you get a whole lot of different information. There's no different information in the book. It just initiated the mind to entertain what it now now has access to, where it didn't have access to before. That's And so you see books that are really good at that, they last for thousands of years. So you have the Tao Te Ching, or you have some old, old scripture, because... When you read it, it initiates the mind to entertain itself. So you read it, when you first read it, you don't get any understanding of it, you know, like Taoism, you know, it's like, oh yeah, go with the flow, whatever, and stuff like that, you know, you don't know what the flow means, it's sort of like a Nike commercial, you know, just do it, or whatever, (laughs) and you're like, oh yeah, you know, to be, yes, just be what you ever are, you know, like the army, be what you can possibly be, you know, you know, it's just, you know, it can be misinterpreted, but if you read it, let's say, a few years later, it it's, has a whole different message, but it doesn't have a different message, it just triggers the, like, the repository of all messages, the mind, yeah, and it has the ability to trigger it, and it's been doing it for so long, it becomes like a a very, very loved, let's say, scripture, or a very, very loved passage, or a very, very loved statement, you know, like the Sermon on the Mount, or something like that, where people from all ages go back to it, and go back to it, and it's like a never-ending mine, yeah, you can just keep, you'll keep getting ore out of it, because the ore isn't in there, it's in the mind that's digging, yeah, that's the whole point. And this description that I always use, which I may use if I run out of steam today, (laughs) because I like it, is called faith mind, and it's just that, faith mind, yeah? Why did he come with that top terminology, faith mind? Why did that come up? Why did he say that? Because that's the only thing that's reliable, really, is the mind, and not the small m mind, as we were going over the other day, but... What I represent the mind, if you ever read any old Zen classics, 
from the Chan period, you know, the Chinese period, they use the term mind a lot. That's what I like. I just like it. This works for me. Yeah? Because it's just like if I read something and it triggers that feeling, yeah, that's what this word does. It triggers an understanding there. And that understanding seems to reverberate then more than consciousness or beingness or awareness. It just resonates more. It just goes bum, 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 bum. So therefore it works for me. Yeah, that's how it goes. So that's the whole point. So this is a message, an invitation. Very short and sweet. And it gets delivered and and then that's the end of my seat assignment, really. It's just to deliver it. You know, it's like a mailman. You don't go follow home the mailman, you know. And you don't try to you don't feel like, oh, I'm gonna do the exact route the mailman takes every day and then I'll get what the mailman has. It's not about the mailman. It's an imitation for you, yeah, for your mind to trigger in its own little way because it's the same same but the way it's going to be expressed and how it's going to feel and how it's going to tumble out of this unique little cookie cutter is going to be different yeah? and that's the beauty of it yeah? that's the whole beauty of it but what it's not like the message has like 8,000 meanings it's the mind that reads it has zillions of possibilities So, and it's where you are it's like in the in book of recovery I was doing this workshop for years, you know, going over this uh, part of this book of recovery to talk about doing inventory processes for people, because it's the main thing to do when you come into recovery. You do a simple inventory of your of your fears, your resentments, and how you've harmed people in the pursuit of what you wanted. And we look at the sexual arena to see that, because it's a pretty good place where self-will you know, expresses itself. So by doing it, you take an inventory, you look, and you get a pattern of how self defeated you. Yeah? How this mental system called self or selfing, I don't, there's no self, but let's call it selfing. This mental system called selfing has defeated you. And the real the defeat, it means it's not all the battles that you go through and all this, it's just the lack of awareness of your own nature. That's the real defeat. You're taking yourself to be something that you're not. And that's a big enough defeat as it is. Yeah? All the other stuff are just scars and other things. But the real defeat is you don't, there's a lack of traveling with the awareness of what you are every day. And that's a big defeat in a sense. Yeah? You're taking yourself to be something else. And that, that one little miscalibration is causing a lot of attraction to stuff that can't seem to be gotten rid of. You know? Things just start coagulating around you. You have events that seem to have happened 20 years ago and they're still there still haunting you all the time. You've got, like, things yipping at your ass, you know, every day. Your past is just chasing you, and the future is a scary little proposition. This isn't because the past and future even have any existence. It's because of the system you're relying on. Yeah? Your mind is resting in a system that promotes all of that. Yeah? It's like a Petri dish that our attention and interest is sort of is sort of introducing all these different cultures to mutate into a state of anxiety. Yeah. And then we want relief from that. We want a relief from what the Petri dish is producing, but we don't want to look at what's, what's the source of the Petri dish. What's the initial thing? What's the two little things that got connected and then just started mutating in time and space to produce the how we travel today? And we're just saying maybe it's where the mind became identified with a crazy idea that it was a thing, you know, either a mental thing or a body or a body thing with a mind or whatever it is. It's just a something that came together and it's had some, uh, some time to fester and it's grown and it's producing its effects, yeah? And it will keep producing its effects. If you never get to the root of something, you're going to be always trimming the tree like this, like they say. Yeah, you always got to, and every year and every month or every day, it's a new crop's going to show up. And you're going to have to become really good at trimming to keep it somewhat at bay. Instead of going to the root and checking out, all right, what's the dilemma? Where did the dilemma start and what's causing it to have such a life? You know, what's invigorating it all day? Because you participate in it. It's not like it's being done to you. It's not like an outside thing is screwing with you. The mind that you're accessing right now is engaged in it. Yeah? 
It's engaged in it in a certain way that's causing it to produce certain effects that seem to cause a lot of disease and discomfort. Yeah? We want to get the relief from the disease and the discomfort, but then the mind really doesn't want to go to the cause. It wants to become a specialist on how to relieve the situation, but it doesn't want to let the situation really change. Yeah? So you see it like in America, as within, so without, the macrocosm and the microcosm. In America, there's such a huge pharmaceutical business. People are taking pills for freaking everything. They take pills to sleep, they take pills to wake up, they have back pain, they take pills, they think they're going to have back pain, they take pills. It's just unbelievable. They have a breakup, they take pills. Yeah, They're waiting to get into a relationship, they're taking pills. It's just unbelievable. And because they have this very flimsy idea that it's being prescribed by a, a medical, wow, a needles in here from uh, the acupuncture we did. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering why I was picking up this frequency. Someone put a new antenna in my head. <laughs> I was picking up a medical channel. <laughs> There's going to be some pharmaceutical commercials today. <laughs> oh, yeah. What the hell is it? Oh, that last message really hurt, though. <laughs> it was Merck. Merck or Star. It's one of those big things. You will blow up your head if you say anything bad about us. <laughs> your time is over. <laughs> There's no pill that will help you. <laughs> <laughs> the master Merck has spoken. <laughs> I was wondering, man. It was like a little lightning bolt right there. Something's telling me this. Well, it sounded really good, Paul. <laughs> I put it back in. <laughs> yeah. so just, I broke the antenna. Oh, <laughs> Give me a hanger. Give me a hanger. <laughs> 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 it's a pirate radio station. <laughs> Hope we recorded it. I did. I got it. Pure, pure download from the pharmaceutical demon. <laughs> Because there's it sort of like is given us certain permission because some pseudo authority has told you to take it, yeah? It's so insane where there's a guy shooting drugs and he doesn't have these so called pseudo authority. But it's the same, same dilemma, really. The people I know, most people that I see in recovery now aren't coming from street drugs. They're coming from fucking stuff that's been prescribed, oxycotons and all that stuff. Tons of oxycotton and these heavy duty synthesized morphines and opiates that are just destroying people and when they try to get off it they have to take something else to get off the first one and so it becomes like a four or five year event just to stop something they chose to do let's say in one minute you know one you know feeling I don't feel comfortable can you give me something that'll help me yeah here you go five years later they're still getting weaned off of it they're still getting weaned off of that solution that's what happens in this place. It's sort of like stepping on fly paper, yeah? And then if you try to put your hand down to get support to get up, that gets stuck, yeah? And then if you put your other hand, that gets stuck, you know? It's like things I chose to do in a night of, like, real dis-ease, then I have a bureaucratic fly paper on for three years <laughs> later. I've got to have your analysis every month, see a probation officer, and all I wanted was freaking relief from what? The original dilemma. This obsessive preoccupation with the thought system. Yeah? Listening to an incredible runaway interpretation of what was claimed to be its life. <laughs> and really, which it's a denial of all the life that's around it. Really. As soon as it becomes my life, I deny all the life that's around it. I basically deny your life. I do. You become an object, you become objectified from the view of my life. 
Yeah. What can you bring to my life? It's not how can I support you in your life, but it's what can you bring to my life? Yeah. It's all these things, all these thousands of flavors or or like manifestations come from the one Petri dish. This is what I saw, you know. And it's that when the mind gets co-opted by this fascination with an idea that came up, this, this mental idea that I'm a long-lasting, independent, separate entity. Yeah? Sounds like it would be fun if you could just have entertained it for maybe a half a day, or, you know, a night. Let's say Friday night, <laughs> I'm going to go out, and I'm going to entertain I'm a long-lasting, independent, so I'm going to the club, meet a girl, get this unique feeling of I'm really special, and then you wake up the next morning and everything is whole and blissful. But no, <laughs> it's like you put your hand in that cookie jar, you can't get it out. Yeah? Now you're walking around with a cookie jar, and everyone's got cookie jars, and no one wants to say, hey, you're fucking cookie jar. You know? <laughs> sort of like, no one wants to admit what's going on. And, you know? <laughs> So if you get to the root, let's say you had a whole, your life could be seen as a row of knots, yeah. In the beginning you didn't have many knots, you were a little kid, unless you were in an abusive situation, I wasn't. When I was a little kid, you know, there was that, seriously, until around, I remember four, around five, five and a half, the whole picture dipped down. It was really bright, yes, and I had it again today. It was really bright, um... You know, and it had been bright for a while, and I never knew that it could be any other way until it about dimmed down. When I think the introspection hit a critical mass, where I was starting to think about this idea of me, and then suddenly the whole stage got darker. I remembered it. It's sort of like when I was young, my family would take us to the beach and everything, and everyone in the family pictures looked like little cherubs and you know everyone was bright and then a few years later there'd be pictures of my family and me and it was like there I was it looked like I was pasted in the picture because I was already separated and I was looking at my mother suspiciously like who are these people you know this whole thing came over me and then it was like it seemed like no turning back it just sort of got so much. You know, it's so amazing because they're working right just here yeah. on the whole route. You have to see it. That's why the marathon's happening today, too. It's the conditional mind trying to thwart us. Don't let it. You know, you really, it's true. It's so funny, you know. I, it's like a huge roof up there. It's a huge roof. Let's, hey, let's work. Hey, bud, work right over there. Okay. You have to appreciate the choreography of life. Really, you do. It's really, there's always, it's, it's always, if you look at it closely, you'll see that the hidden autograph of what's so, you know, you'll see it there. <laughs> so, you know, so there I was, and uh, then that thing started coming on, on to this little character, whatever. And then it, it got absorbed in that thing. And then events occurred that really uh, threatened me, like my parent, my grandmother who lived with us died when I was nine. My father died when I was nine. And it felt like I had this giant love extension, and then what it was extending to was gone. You know? was, there was no, nowhere to, for the love to hit, and it felt a little scary, so it was like, you know, let's get up, got to have the walls come up. Yeah. That's how it felt. And I remember I was in fourth grade, and... Um, my sis, my nun of the teacher was Sister Marie Neal, and my they all died in six months. Like my grandfather, my uh, my grandmother, my father. So I uh, remember I had to do all this stuff, and Sister Marie Neal had a had a bad problem also. When she came back, it was funny because let's say she was sitting right where Tana was before all this happened, and I could you know, and I was about three three desks away. So I saw her, and it was like twelve feet, let's say, between us. I came back from all this activity, and there it was, and we we're still only 15 feet apart, but I was miles away. I was so far gone, up the ass of self, in a way. I was so far retreated, only listening to this council. I mean, really far. It was like way, way up there. And then from there, everything else proceeded. Then the alcoholism kicked in. I started to start drinking and using, 
and then all of that, all of that spawned all of this and all of this, and it just started multiplying to it was like an avalanche of circumstances and consequences. Yeah? And that sense of being that little kid was totally gone. There was no more wonder and awe. I didn't feel a fucking thing, basically. I had to shoot drugs to feel something. I had to, you know, I had to do an extreme event to get a sense of being alive. And um, once you make the deal with the devil, it's hard to break the contract. That's the way it goes. Yeah. It's sort of like you want to you want to get off the boat, but you ain't getting off the boat <laughs> because now you're in a real strange condition. You're powerless. Yeah. You have no power, yet you're the source of all the power, but your whole power has been commandeered by this mental parasite. You're powerless. Yeah? And the condition is, you're in a state of unmanageability, and yet it's caused by your trying to manage. And you can't help but try to manage, because it seems so freaking unmanageable. Yeah? So you're in this very fixed dilemma. And this is all stemming from the original disease, the original addiction to the idea of being a long-lasting, independent, separate entity. It all stemmed from there. Without that as the basis, none of this other shit could have grown. None of it. Because when that was finally looked at, none of that had any more life. The alcoholism got to a point where it doesn't even exist. Yeah? Now that's a damn good solution, isn't it? If something that had such a huge influence on your life can get to a point where it doesn't seem to exist anymore, that's a damn good solution. And that's been my experience with it. And it's been my experience of a lot of people I know who've had it. Where something that was so dominant lost all effect. How could that possibly be if it was real? It w- if it was real, how could it possibly lose all its effect? It must be that it only seems to be so. And it must be, if that only seems to be so, when it was the biggest influence in my freaking life, then I guess everything else in my life only seems to be so. You can't just state, you can't just individualize a principle. When it's demonstrated, it's nice to let the mind expand on it. Yeah? And say, if this is seemingly so, the most dominant thing that ever happened to me, where I lost the sense of being a kid and grew into that, in a sense, if that isn't seem isn't truly so, then what the freak is? Yeah? What truly is so? And in investigation I found enough information that there ain't anything really so. That this whole state we're in is a seeming state. It's appearing to be true or false. It's never true or false because it doesn't have the quality of either. It has a it's like a it appears, yeah? And who gives the quality to it? This is the trick. Who gives the quality to it? You and I do. And what did society and a lot of upbringing take away? That power, in a way. Yeah. You become a victim quite a lot. You become, you become something that needs a lot of work. Yeah. You're constantly told, especially women, the conditioning of women is amazing in society. You know, based on their physical appearance. I cannot believe what they have to go through. Yeah, because every magazine is picturing some freaking thin railed insane gazebo from somewhere, you know. <laughs> and you're supposed to look like that every day. Give me a break. They don't even eat anymore, I don't think. You know, some of them. It goes on and on and on and on. The mind has a field day with that. It has the one idea, perhaps there's something wrong with me, and then it just gets fed. Yeah? And it runs with it. Like John Coltrane running with a note and just ripping. Yeah? Because the mind, what it does is entertain. But its entertaining is based on certain premises, certain assumptions, certain standards it has to be resting on, and then it riffs off of there. Yeah? So as soon as it takes the idea that I'm a long lasting, lasting independent, separate, separate entity, separation has to abound. There must be a difference between me and you. There must be a difference between everything and everything else. And therefore, it just expresses itself in thousands of different degrees of difference. Yeah? And yet, all of it is coming from a crazy assumption that there could be any independent, long-lasting, independent, separate entity that has a power in and unto itself. It's an insane idea. It's never even proven by any objective looking. Yeah? 
And then once you believe this, once you start thinking about these insane ideas, then when I was a kid, when I was playing, I never was worrying, will I be playing next week? Because I didn't have time yet as a constraint. I had no idea that what next week meant when I was two or three years old. Yeah? What the hell is next week? So when I was playing, it was just playing. Yeah? What, and I didn't have any idea that it could be anywhere else, so I didn't really think where I was that was that bad. I didn't, wasn't constantly judging where I was because it was the only place I could be. What an obvious bit of common sense. Yeah? But then I lose all this stuff, and then I start assuming I could be somewhere other than where I am. Yeah? And then the mind goes, okay, let's riff on that and look at us, look at our days up there. Yeah? And then what happened is the year that I was seemingly in when I was a kid became quickly or slowly got morphed into a mental here. A mental here that's just predominated by the past and the future. It's just chock full of the past and the future. Yeah? So when I, when, I, when I started to keep growing into this mental here, and the here was forgotten, I wanted out of the mental here. But I thought it was here. Yeah. I mistook it. And the solution was here, right where the mental here seemed to be appearing. And it was the last place I ever fucking looked. And all I wanted to do was get out of this here. Yeah? And so I found drinking and drugs, and it seemed to work. I got out of the mental here in a way, but yeah... But the fact is, I didn't truly get out of it. It was just a very s small temporary relief with a huge cost of years. For like a half an hour of relief, I got days of, of shit. And it just compounded. And the payoff-cost ratio kept going, changing. I got a little payoff, more cost, little payoff, more cost. And then when, it was, when I really wanted to renege on the contract, it was done. <laughs> there was no reneging. <laughs> it just kept going down and down and down. And so I was apt to do anything, anything to get relief. I would pay any consequence tomorrow to feel a little bit comfortable now. When did, how did that happen to that supposed kid at four years old, five years old? How did it turn into that? You know, how does that happen? Well, I would say how it happened was it needed a basis. The insanity had to seem sane somehow. And once it got established, it started building on that insane idea. So the first thing was, I could be somewhere that I'm not. Yeah? I could be better than I am. But the better, the am, the am I was, wasn't even that am. It was a mental idea. And I found that, you know what? This is seen as an urban renewal project. It, if, I'm, if I'm identified as this, I'm, it's never going to be done, that construction site. Never. It doesn't matter how good I do, there will always be fault found. Yeah? It just doesn't, it will not happen. Yeah? It has tons of formulas to go to this little magical kingdom of happiness, joy, and freedom, but none of them work. Yeah? Because if you're on your 68th formula, the system that's giving you the formulas obviously doesn't work. Yeah? Because maybe the first few should have. <laughs> if you're still buying number 68, yeah, and then hoping that nine, number 90 is going to be the one... Yeah, <laughs> you've fallen prey to a very large delusion. Yeah? So then, okay, you have that, you finally someone get, make some sense of the whole situation. Then you want to call it a spiritual message or something. And then you go, okay, I see it. Yeah? I want out. Now you fall into the second trap in a way. Self can't get out of self. Now this is a much subtler trap. Much subtler. Because now, you've got a lot of engine and a lot of desire to get out of what you seemingly are in. Yeah? And you think it's noble, and you think it can't be co-opted because it's noble, and it seems authentic, so you think it's like gilded with some kind of protection, and nothing could sort of co-opt this feeling, I'm sure. It's so pure of a desire to become, become free that possibly no thing could screw with this. Well, it's already been co-opted, in a sense, because now it's going to be that formatted system, that idea of you, is going to attempt to leave the system that's producing it. Yeah? So, a product of a system that's producing it can't leave the system, because if it did, it wouldn't be produced. Yeah? There is no self. It only can appear to be so. So, if the self just says, I'm going to finally break out of this system... It would be in for a rude awakening 
because when it left the system, there would be no sense of self. Yeah, and that's what's happening with a lot of people. They're still holding on to the idea that they want to be here to, when they get it. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Yeah. So the system is now wanting to get out of itself, which is another level of excruciating pain. Yeah. Because now you enter into a realm which I noticed when I started doing these talks at other groups and recovery groups that spiritual seeking, which you know they should have rehabs for spiritual seeking. They should. <laughs> They should have like more than 28 day programs. It should be longer. They should have you where you can't go on any retreats, no DVDs, <laughs> no curtains. <laughs> no, you know, no. just like try to abstain for all that indulging. You know, and they should have interventions, really. I should come over and say, stop fucking reading those scriptures. <laughs> stop. <laughs> okay, I will. <laughs> Let me be the <laughs> No, stop. <laughs> Seriously. It's an illness in and of itself. It's another attribute of the one illness. It just <coughs> because the idea of self trying to get out of self is re- supported by so many great statements in those supposed scriptures. And one of them from Hoang Po, and he's a many Zen teacher said it, which was you can't use mind to get out of mind. <laughs> You can't use mind to find mind. You can't use the Buddha to find the Buddha. Yeah? You can't use light to find light. Now there must be a situation here that the light that we are is being unacknowledged and therefore, in a very co-opted way, that desire for freedom has been distorted. It has been crimped. It has the, that arrow has been bent. So every time you fire it, it doesn't go towards the mark where you're shooting it for. It brings you back like an Australian boomerang back into the system that you're trying to get out of. Yeah? So that's sort of like the seventh, second dilemma in a way. That self can't get out of self. So then hopefully you get to that point where you reach that after that second point that you turn back and go, okay, then how can I get out of self? So let's say you take a two-year course studying self but that could be construed as obsession with self. Yeah? So you can't get out of it that way. So self-knowledge isn't going to avail you anything. Fuck, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> so the system, because its system is to know and grasp, is going to keep trying to know and grasp, and it's going to keep grasping at straws that the system itself is offering. Yeah? And that's the dilemma, in a way, because it wants to know and grasp. And in this case, about what we are, you can't know what you are. It's not open to an experience because you are it. Yeah? It will in, infuse all your experiences if you entertain it, but it can't be turned into an experience because you are it. Yeah? You can't go like this and turn around and experience yourself. Yeah? You can experience everyone else you can experience everything else based on that state of being and an acknowledgement of that state of being and then that state of being will infuse your experience with a different flavor than it's being infused with this mental preoccupation. That happens, but you'll never have an experience of yourself. So that has to be given up. That, that, that drive that the mental condition has to know, to experience, to acquire to achieve, to say this is mine, is not workable in this one level. Maybe you can do it with real estate, maybe you can do it with like prop, you know, property, cars, girlfriends, boyfriends, you know, money, but you ain't going to pull it off with this one. It just doesn't work. So the system now is getting to a point where it's going to break down because now it's gone through the two things and now it's still t- attempting to get nothing. Yeah? And every time it attempts to get nothing, it realizes every time it tries to grab nothing with this, with the tools of the system, it makes it something. And as soon as it picks it up and it's something, it doesn't fucking work. Yeah? So then it drops it and it's still nothing. And then, okay, I'm going to approach it this way. So now I was a seeker, now I'm going to be a non seeker. Yeah? I was a self, now I'm going to become a non self. Yeah? I'm going to be a self masquerading as a non self. Let me see if I can pick it up this time and let it be nothing. And as soon as I pick it up, as soon as I use these hands from the system that I'm identified as, it makes it something. 
So maybe, all right, I'm going to cut my hands off. So then you'll be like, you'll pick it up with your feet. You know what I mean? And you'll make it something. The system will attempt to come out, come through the skylight, the back door, the side door, the cellar. It will sell. It will come up to you as a vacuum salesman, you know, a, a Tupperware representative. It will do whatever it needs to do, yeah, to, to, to keep you engaged. And then hopefully, finally, you'll sit here at these meetings, and I feel this is a great delivery system, yeah? Because it's not like a 30-day event you're going to sign up to. You don't have to have chefs come in have the greatest food and then little tantric practitioners which would be nice though but you're not <laughs> yeah, you know foot massages in the day they're all great but it would be more like a spa you know this is be a, an invitation and if the invitation is worth its salt it probably will be repeated because it needs usually to be repeated yeah so then satsang will be offered not once but it will be offered again and again so the repetition will occur and then the lazy Susan of that system that's constantly seeking and searching, every once in a while, some of the message will get in, yeah? And then it'll hit raw mind. And what will happen is, the message will freeze the conditional mind, because it's an activity, yeah? Selfing, the system of, of selfing is like a, a, a live wasp nest. It's just an activity, constantly agitated, yeah? Constantly agitated. So, when you hear a statement that and, and they, because of the mind's power, a certain statement or a certain meaning or a certain moment in nature or a certain time when you're making love or something, it will freeze the system. The system of selfing will freeze, and what will happen is raw mind will dominate. Or let's say unconditional mind, or the pause, or whatever you want to say. It. But raw mind, raw mind will now rock the, what, all those strewn envelopes that the conditional mind made into something, and it will realize what the real message is. Yeah, that, ah, mind, yeah? I am not that. I am not that. I am not that thing that's saying, I'm the one who did this. I'm not that saying, I'm the one who achieved that. I am not that one that all this yapping is about. I'm just, maybe I'm just not that one, yeah? I don't know what else I may be, but I'm, maybe, just maybe, I'm not that. And then it, it falls upon that idea, and then it starts circling around it, and it starts entertaining it in different ways, yeah? What would it mean if I'm not that? And then it starts finding out. It starts entertaining a different proposition, yeah? And now, this mind, instead of being centered in selfing, and being all of its ability to entertain, being defined by the framing of self-centeredness, which is when it would entertain or have the... Enter, uh, the entertaining of okayness, it would be thrust into time. I was once okay, and I will be okay, yeah? Which actually, what it does is it uses the hope of okayness and the remembrance of okayness to make sure that you really feel unokay now. <laughs> That's what it does. Because it has you, when you're squirming, much better if you are still on the bait. If you pause on the bait and don't move, that flips it out. If it keeps you agitated, then you it has you. Then you're hooking yourself, yeah? If you're reacting to it, then it has you, yeah? The immunity is there's a pause. It doesn't mean the system stops. It means you're jumping to the bait stops. That's it. The system is going to keep systemizing, yeah? Just like your, your nervous system is going to keep firing. Your digestion system is going to keep digesting, well, this mental process is going to keep selfing, yeah? But the point is, it's the mind, the mind alone that infuses it with all that meaning, yeah? The mind and mind alone. It's not like the movie of selfing, you know, the narrative that selfing is presenting, isn't the real, isn't the, it isn't the quality of that, it's the quality of the audience that's buying it, yeah? It's the mind that's buying the movie that makes it have Technicolor or Panavision surround sound. Yeah? Totally captivating. It's not the movie. It really isn't. It's not the movie at all. The production value is pretty weak. It's the same old, same old. It only has a few loops, a few reels. 
this is how it was, this is what I think it's going to be like, and you're fucked, you know? <laughs> this is all this. Or you may be fucked, you once were fucked, or someone's... Mo- un- oh, I shouldn't just curse anymore. You know, whatever. Someone's better than you, or thank God someone's worse than me, and all like, what all that? It's, always, it's just running it. What gives it such life is you! You! You as mine, me as this as mine, gives it the life that it has. Because when it's extracted, you'll see it doesn't have any life. That's how you truly know. If you have the moment of grace, and all of us have, every day there's so many free samples. It's just like, you know, if you had a miracle at 9.30 this morning, you'd probably forget it by 11. But if you have a resentment of 35 years ago, you'd still remember it from. <laughs> this is the skewed uh, sense of the conditional mind. Yeah, It has a, very, it has a preference, and ver- it... it it cherry picks its intelligence. It has to support its fucking story. That's what it does. Yeah. So here, you, we have tons of those free samples. The thing is, is when a free sample seems to dawn on us, it's nice to sort of erect a mobile temple there. Honor it. Yeah. Honor it. Honor that cause. Yeah. If you become conscious of it when it's uh, when it's there, honor it because then you'll become conscious of it when it's not there. When it's seemingly not there, you'll start becoming conscious of it. That's where it really gets juicy. Yeah. <clears throat> when it's there, when it's con- when you when you can be conscious of it, when that pause, when that freeze, or when that interruption of the selfing has occurred, and there's that relief, you know, and we all know it. Build a temple there, honor it, and so because then you'll be conscious of it when it's not there, or seemingly not there, because it's always there. Yeah? But I'm telling you, it's going to seem like it's not there. And, you, and that's the only thing, is to have the mind make that leap when it has no sense of it, yeah? because at the point it will also have the sense of it when it seems not to be there. Everyone comes to these meetings and they get into that. They go, I understand what you're saying, I know what you're saying. But I come in and out of it. I go here and I go there. And if I'm in a certain place, it feels really good. I'm connected. But then something occurs, I'm disconnected. At those moments, you can still be conscious of it, even though it doesn't seem to be so. Yeah? Because it's not there. It's not how outside. The pause isn't being brought to you from some outside source. You are it. Yeah? So therefore, you are it when it doesn't seem to be so, and you are it when it seems to be so, in your experience. When it seems to be so in your experience, it's fun, it's great, you know? But the, the, real, the real immunity comes for when, you, when you know it's there, when it doesn't seem to be so. Yeah. If it, and if it helps to go to places where it will seem to be so for a week or two, then do it. You know, do a retreat if that's the case. Get a flavor of it. But the fact is, then you'll be dependent on retreats. If it doesn't make the leap into realizing it, that it's there when it doesn't seem to be so. That the seemingly so and the not seemingly so are the same. They're both seeming leaks. But what's truly so is always there. Yeah? So your mind makes a leap to the absolute in a way. What's always so? is the leavening agent between what seems to be so and what doesn't seem to be so. Because your feelings of elation are going to seem to be so sometimes and not seem to be so. No one's going to be elated all the time. That's an experience. No one can be blessed all day. They're going to, that's an experience. But the, the sense of what's always so can be held. Yeah? Or actually is the holding of you. Have faith in mind. It can make that leap. It just may be crimped by some other idea you have that I have to do something to get this or do that. And if it's not felt all the time, then it's not so. It's the mind pulling another trick on you. It's throwing it back into the experiential level. And the experiential level is based on a very dualistic construct. You're not feeling great all the time. Yeah? And even if you felt great all the time, your head would say, that isn't the great, I thought I wanted to feel great all the time. It would, it, would, it would make it into another great, yeah? So there would be the, but that's the real, real great. This is just a half, yeah, it's a semi-real great. I want the real, real great, or I'm not there yet. You're never going to be there. Because there is no there to be there at. 
It's here, right now. While all of it's going on the way it seems to be going on, just hold the sense that it's a seemingly so. Seemingly, it appears to be true or false. Not to who? It's not saying it appears to be true or false. If, if the whole basis of this place is that it appears to be true or false, then to who? I would say to what, actually? Yeah? Because the what is what you want to know. If everything here, it just has no meaning whatsoever, it can appear to be true or it can appear to be false, then you want to find out where the meaning's coming from. Yeah, that would be the source to have an acknowledgement of. If you're attempting, you know what I mean? If you, just, to me, it's just, just so fucking practical. You know what I mean? It just is. If, if, if everything is seemingly so, if everything is given the meaning by something, I mean, what are you going to say? What's giving it the meaning? God? Then maybe you're probably God. Whatever name you want to give it, I would trace it back to this, right? this opportunity, because it's not in any other place meaning's being given. Yeah, This is where it's happening. You can watch it all day. Based on whatever you think your condition is, that's how the day's going to be given meaning. You know, This could be a great Sunday or it could be a terrible Sunday. Not based on the Sunday. What's a fucking Sunday? <laughs> yeah? This is one of the worst Sundays I've ever had, right? Line up all the Sundays and measure them. They all seem to have the same 24 hours. And, you know, there was a certain amount of daylight and night, clouds or whatever. This is a, this is a great one right here, this Sunday. You know? No. What's giving that day the meaning? If everything's seemingly so, if everything's appearing to be true or false to you, which would be important to look at? The you, wouldn't it? If the you changes, then the, the true and falseness of everything would change, wouldn't it? Now, if you don't believe that, that you're giving everything the meaning, then why are we having a subjective experience here? We're at the same event, we're in the same temperature, we're hearing the same noises, yeah? Yet all of us have a different experience. What's giving that that same event so much so many different flavors? The event or the one who's attending the event? You go to a football game, sixty thousand people there. There's if you look at the stats, there was thirty 30 first downs, let's say, 200 yards made, 300 yards passed, yeah? All that can be said, and that's un- indisputable, yet there were 60,000 different experiences of the game. It matters what jacket color you were wearing, if you were from Toronto or you were from New Jersey, yes? It matters be how you woke up and thought you felt that day, how many beers you had at the game, how many knockworts you ate or something. Yeah, your stomach was bothering you, your wife was bothering you, whatever. So that, that one event would be the Petri dish for billions of, ex, of, of subjective experiences arising. The one football game, yeah? The stats of that one game, of the yards and the passes, can you imagine if you took the stats of all the subjective experiences that one game engendered? Millions and millions of different takes on the one event. That's what's happening here, Yeah? Millions and millions of takes on the one event. Yeah. You go to a workplace. There's, you're having a bad day and you're thinking it's Joe that's screwing with you. Joe's thinking you're screwing with him. <laughs> yeah. Everyone's got their little take on the event that's going on. Who the hell knows what's happening? Exactly, really. But you damn better see that there's a lot of subjective experiences being put out there. Yeah. The experience is just the vehicle. The mind is putting meaning into it. Yeah, it's the it's the chef, it's the cook, it's throwing all the flavors and the ingredients in. Yes. So if you're tired of the fare that you've been eating every day, if it looks like it's the same old, same old, if it sounds like the same old, same old interpretations, you have the same old, same old fears and the same old, same old anxieties. There ain't oh, there's nothing called an anxiety. It's being produced by where you're looking at it from, situation from. Yeah. Go back and see where the meaning's coming from. If you follow it, it's like putting a tail on a mouse. It will take you back to the hole. 
from where it's issuing for. And what I found is it's coming from a system of thought and interpretation called self-centeredness. Yeah? That the mind right now is pretty much formatted in looking at life and how it pertains to itself as this long-lasting independent separate entity. And therefore, it's interpreting life from that point of view. Yeah. So if you're not happy with what's going on, it's probably really based on how you're looking at it, more so than what's going on. Of course, if your house is on fire, you better get a pail of water. Yeah. But then maybe if you, get, if you have a lot of string of houses on fire and a lot of pails of water needed, maybe you could question what's going on. Because maybe you're adding to the fire yeah. by building all these houses or <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Just maybe. And if you see that they're issuing forth from a system called self-centeredness, and you entertain, now what do you want to do? Go to war with that system? But if you went to war with that system, and what we just talked about before, and the problem is you're identified as the center of the system, it would be going war with yourself. Who could you call the winner? Who's going to win a war with yourself? Yeah. Which self is going to reign supreme? You would feel one is, but then maybe the next day you're more identified with the other. Now you're the loser. Yeah? There's no stability there. But what would happen if you question the center of the system where the, it, the meaning is being issued from? Yeah? Maybe if you're not the center of the system, then the influence of the system in your experience would diminish. Just maybe. Maybe if you found that one cog that connects the whole machinery, yeah, that all the other cogs and nuts and bolts revolve around it. If you take this out, they all lose their purpose in a way. They stop grinding. They stop moving so much. Yeah? They're all based on this one little energy source, this pulsating magnetic I me mind. If I'm not that, what could possibly happen? This is the joy of it. You'll find out. No one can say what's going to happen, but you'll find out what's going to happen. And that's the greatest teaching of all. Finding out. Mental knowing is flimsy. When the shit hits the fan, it's never there to really be available to help you. But know when you find out about something, then you're the living scripture. You're learning in and of yourself. You see, you can tell, you will be able to recognize the problem from the relief of it. When you get relieved of it, you'll recognize it. You will see it as clear as day. You will see what the dilemma is and was and could possibly still be. If you put, if your intention and interest keeps going in there, yeah, you'll see it. You'll see it as clear as day. You'll be able to tell red from red and blue and blue. blue. There won't be as, there won't be all this confusion. I don't understand. You'll understand really clearly. And then you'll see that you know what this mind that I'm aligned with, this idea of being Paul, maybe wants to want to be free, but doesn't want to be free whatsoever. It has no intention of letting go, none whatsoever. It wants to pantomime the act of letting go, but it wants to hold the best card of all. I can take it back. That ain't abandoning. That's a deal. <laughs> that's not. That's not working. It's not. Yeah. You'll see it, and you know what? And then you'll see all the meaning your mind wants to give that I, that that idea of you that doesn't want to be free. And then you let it. All right. I don't fucking want to be free. I don't want to fucking go to a sweat. I don't want to sit. That's what's so trippy. I went to. This, I got introduced to a sweat years ago. I didn't never been on one, and some lady. Uh, and I'm not anything to do with sweats. So nothing against them, but just as an example. So I went, and it was a. It was this big one in Mount Shasta, up in Northern California, and people from all around the country, actually from the world, were coming to this one event. I had no idea how incredibly important it was <laughs> in this one spiritual realm. And they had the native Indian, and they built a couple of these giant uh, things to go in. And I'd never done one, so they built one. There was about 60 people in this one, and it was the first one of the three-day thing. And I got in there, and I had no idea. And they had things like this, like, uh, like branches, saplings like this, but like these things. And some people were standing up holding on to them, and there's people sitting everywhere. And then they put, and they have this huge pit with the rocks, and they put hot, super hot water, I mean water on it, and the rocks are super hot, and just fucking... <laughs> you get waves of heat hit you. It's just incredible. So I didn't realize that when the flat went down, everyone sat down because heat rises, you know. And when I time I tried to realize it, I couldn't sit down. There was no space. 
So I was like on a subway to hell. <laughs> I was sitting like this, and the, that first wave hit, and the way it came, and it burnt my underarms, and went in my, my nostrils, and burnt my ears. <laughs> so it's like fucking, like hell. But I wasn't gonna, I'm gonna, I was gonna get purified at any cost. <laughs> and I was just praying like I never prayed. Please stop throwing that water on the rocks. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I wanted, I was just, if I wasn't socialized, I would have just ripped, you know, just ran over everyone's body and got through the flat, but I, I had my spiritual image I was protecting. You know, I can do it. And then finally the flap opened and I ran out, you know, and I jumped in the stream. It was a huge rush. And then they had the next, they had the next edition and I got in there, but this time I sat and I swear I was like this, trying to, and I could feel the waves hitting me. I tried to buffer it and the heat was just unbelievable. And so, I stayed there the whole weekend, yeah? Now, what happened? I did. And the, and the Indian tried to make it with the woman I was with. That was, was trippy. She was sitting next to him, and he's putting his hand on her thigh while everyone was burning into a crisp. He was putting the moves on her. So it was crazy. So, I, uh, so, I, uh, so after a few years, you know, I heard this idea, this message, and I had entertained it. And uh, still entertaining it. And uh, my friend... Uh, who I worked with in recovery, him and his other friends got into Native American stuff, and they were going to have a sweat at the, this guy's house about a half hour from where I live. And he wanted me to go with him, yeah, support him. I said, sure, sure. So there was only like 12 guys, but they got an Indian from Oklahoma. They came, and they built this the way they're supposed to build it, and they had all these drinks and uh, food outside, and we all go into the tent, and the, you know they start doing the prayers, and the, they throw the thing on, and the first wave hits me, and I go on hot, and I get right up and leave. Yeah? It took no thought whatsoever. Just a pure response. Fuck. I'm hot. Got up and left. And I go outside. All the food's there. The drink. And I can hear them all praying and moaning. And I'm just sitting outside, drinking. And it was a beautiful storm at night. And I was having a great time. What happened over those few years? My mind changed. Yeah? I saw no, po- no point in that. No point at all. And it was totally okay. There was no spiritual judge saying, you must purify. Fuck all that. It was just like, it's hot. I'm not, I don't need to put up with this. And that's the point. This is the easiest off the way. Jeez, yeah. Respond. Yeah, you have the ability to see what's going on. What would that one sweat lead to? Another sweat, and another sweat, and another sweat. You know, you get into the hamster cage of practices sometimes, you know. The first three-day retreat then leads to a seven-day retreat, then a two-week retreat, then a retreat that half's talking, half's <laughs> silent, then there's the therapeutic, tantric retreat with vegan food, <laughs> and then the retreat with kayaking, and you know, which is really basically a, a vacation. Where you meditate an hour, so you get some spiritual credit, creds, you know. I was on a retreat. Yeah, what did you do? Kayak, and surf. And, oh, yeah, I went on that retreat to myself, too. You know? I didn't pay $12,000. I went by myself. Kayak and surf, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, you know, so there you go, the first, the second, and the third. Right? You realize that you can't embrace this message. That this, the, this thing, you know, like the mechanical picking up thing and trying to figure it out, this, it can't do it. Nothing can't be approached. Yeah, you can't build a fence around nothing. You can't pay a you know you can't charge a mission to get to nothing. You won't even recognize it. Yeah, and if you try to pick it up, if you try to get it, you make it into something. Yeah, why? Because it's nothing. It's nothing. It's not making itself into the message. Doesn't change when you get it. The message is there's no one to get anything. You get free from. The one who wants to get the message. You don't get freed by the message. You get freed from the one who wants to get the message. That's what you get freed from. You get free from the need to be liberated. You get freed from some godforsaken purpose that someone told you you had to have and use for this life. To add another sense of stress over every day. 
You know, what am I doing? How am I using my time? You know, got to make every second count. Every second counts because you're there. So the, the moments aren't to acquire value, they're to express value. This is a possibility, not an endurance test of arrive somewhere. It's a, a place to, ex, to express. Yeah. It can be expressed in a leisurely way or an endurance type way, but there no, there's no one way because it's not about getting anywhere. It's about realizing where you are is that that's it. Yeah. Wherever that is. I'm in Toronto now. Yeah. My mind's not entertaining I could be anywhere else. I'm not afraid of sharks because I'm not in the water. I'm not afraid of next week because this is not happening. Yeah, I don't regret the past because this. How could I can't even see the past? How can I regret it? I don't even you know you know what I mean. I, I don't see any, I don't see its influence like a, a, a physical wave coming over me. I just don't see it. I see it's made up in the head, like everything else is. Yeah, and there must be a place where all that's being made up, where what's making it up uh, uh, resides. And I would say, if you're at the, at the event horizon of where everything's being made up, you're pretty much where the mind that's making it up is. Yeah? And maybe if you would stop trying to turn around and find it as this idea of being a self, you'd be realizing you're looking from it right now. Yeah? So what's ever doing that exhausts you from this turnaround to try, it's like that, like, you know, what's looking is what you're looking for. So you're like, oh, well, how can, you're never going to look, you're never going to see it because it's what's looking. You can't use the looking for to find what's looking. There's a recognition of, okay, the looking for stops and then, oh, that's what's looking, you know. And then what happens, like in Zen, first there is the mountain, then there is no mountain, then there is the mountain. So, it hits you, you're what's looking, so then the looking for seems to stop, and then it kicks up again. But it's totally different now. Yeah. So first there's what's, there's what's looking is what you're looking for, then there's what's looking, and the you drops out. Yeah. And then there's what's looking, and now then the you appears again, looking for. That's all. But it's totally different now. You're not going to change the looking for. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the, the, the mental process, this apparatus, this programming does. It's looking for. It's looking for a meal. It's looking for a good deal for, on shoes. Yeah? It's looking for a place to stay when it comes in Toronto. It's looking for a second helping of the rice and, and uh, mung doll it had last night. Yeah? It, it's looking for a new record it wants to get. It's looking for like a poster by Alex Gray. It's looking for something. Yeah? I'm going to sit and I'm not looking for anything. Give me a freaking break. You're just not the one that's looking for. No. Why would you want to... Get, why? It's just crazy to me. It's crazy. It's like Ramana says a simple statement. Maybe he was only talking to one person at night, but I like the whole... I expand on it. He says, someone must have been asking him about something. He says, hey, listen, you don't have to give up the possessions. Just give up the possessor. I think that's pretty good. That could apply to most situations, yeah? You don't have to give up the looking. Just give up the looker. Yeah? You don't have to give up the doing. You just give up the doer. You don't, give, you don't have to give up all the having. You give up the haver. Yeah? And then what comes, comes. And what doesn't come, doesn't come. Yeah, you'll be taken care of. Haven't you? You're here. We're not starving. If we were starving and we were destitute right now, this talk wouldn't be appropriate. We'd be taking you out to get something to eat and getting a jacket to wear. That would be appropriate, yeah? Everything is appropriate. There's no, nothing overrides everything else. And then you start becoming flexible. You can respond to situations. You know, you may have a plan and then something happens and the plan gets altered. That's the way it goes. I see people where I live, they're so driven because of the weather. And I, I, can, I can see how they want to get what they can get. You know, they work, let's say, all week, and it's beautiful where I live. And then on the weekend, sometimes it gets really cloudy, and they're still driving to the beach. It's going to be freezing out there. <laughs> the wind's blowing, it's freaking total, the fog's rolled in, the surf sucks, but there's tons of cars going there. And then they come, and then well, basically what they get is the experience of traffic all day. 
They didn't get much of the beach, and they're all driving, you know, sullen and unhappy driving back, but they had to get to the beach, you know. It's like a form of slavery. It's always moving, constantly driving. Even if you run into peace right now, the thought system, if it's the navigator, is so drenched in time, you'll, the peace won't be able to be enjoyed or relaxed in because you'll be worrying about, will I be there tomorrow? Yeah? You get somewhere, you think, if you believe you're the achiever of something, then you're going to worry about losing it when you arrive. Yeah? If you believe you did something to get somewhere, you're going to look at everything you do to make sure you try to stay there. Yeah? The addiction and the obsession just reinvigorates itself over and over again. Whatever, whatever you get introduced to, it gets morphed by the format. And you think something is noble enough to override that format? Nothing here is noble. Mind reigns supreme. The greatest message can become a problem here. The clearest message that was ever delivered can become a problem in like a day after it's been translated. Some people love certain messages, and this is how it is. It's so beautiful in a way, really. I know a guy who's with Carlos Castaneda. You know, you ever hear of Carlos Castaneda, Don Juan and everything? Well, I never met someone who was actually with that guy, but this guy was with him for a few years. And he thinks he, him and these witches were the real deal. And then there's all these people that think Carlos Castaneda was a fraud. Yet, all these other people have been inspired by those 11 books he wrote. See? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he was a fraud or not. The mind makes it what it wants. Some people got the most they ever got out of anything from those books. Yeah? It always goes back to the mind. If you have, if the principle is you and I give everything all the meaning it has, there's no exemption to that. Yeah, it's not like it's only that that only uh, occurs Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays of the fifth month of the third year of the tenth anniversary or something. You know what I mean? It's a, a principle. In other words, that's what's happening all day. You and I are giving all the meaning it has, all the meaning, anything we've come in contact with here. Buddhism, Buddha, you know, Jesus, everything. Yeah. That's why they say, if you see the Buddha on the street, shoot him. (laughs) They do. I love that statement. Because you're throwing your own Buddha nature out on someone else. And it's so easy to throw it out on a past historical figure, because they can never argue with you. You can have every idea you think and go, Buddha agrees with me. Yes, I ran it by Buddha today. How? (laughs) Well, I just know I just know this is the truth. You, may be, you know, I see these people with lineage pictures. If that t- teacher came, they'd say, I don't know you. What the fuck do you have your picture on this table floor in front of me? You know what I mean? I don't know who you are. The whole point is, it's got to come back to us. If not, where are you going to, how, are you going to move in with your teacher? Are you going to live with him or her every second of every day? Watch videos of them all day? Jesus Christ. I mean, we went to eat. I like Shri Sh- Sh- Chinmoy, but we had a... Shri Sh- Chinmoy was a teacher. I don't know if he's live or not. Nothing. I love Shri Sh- Chinmoy. But they have a video of Shri Sh- Chinmoy doing possibly everything. You know, walking a dog, hanging out, lifting people. You know, because he's like a Superman or something. Have people on this thing and he lifts them up and they go, you know, all right. You know, and maybe a half hour, but all day. He's left the building. Oh, has he? Yeah. You know? I mean, jeez. As sooner or later, it's going to end up where we are. It's going to be, you have to be the final authority in a sense. You know? That's where the unspoken, someone else's unspoken yes isn't going to echo in you for long. You know? The unspoken yes. That aha. I see it so much with people at talks. I, and some I do talks in places, not like you know Maui and you know uh, Aspen, you know or Esalon. I do it in Staten Island, fucking the Bronx, you know New Jersey. <laughs> People that seem to have been uh, affiliated with a very small cultural view, yet they all get it. They can't translate it yet. Yeah, their mind makes it something really quick, but when they hear it, they know it. 
they get it. It's like Eckhart Tolle meets the Sopranos. You know, they're fucking it's great. They get it. I can see it in their face. I can see it in their eyes. But it gets extinguished really fast, or some, a fast gets put over them, like Jesus said. They can't extinguish the light, but a, a, a social, environmental, mental basket gets put over it, and then it's difficult to see through all the weaving, you know. But the initial hit is an aha, changes their view the rest of their lives. Just like that. Not years and years of study. Just a hearing this message. Just a simple imitation. Yeah? Now, if it's repeated, and you can take advantage of the repetition, then it gets the mind gets familiar with it. And therefore, it has those moments where it recognized it, and it will hold on to those moments when it's not recognizing it. Yes? So it will be like, you know, they said, what did they say? Faith with seeing is easy. It's the faith without seeing or something like that. Yeah? That faith becomes established and now you have the eyes to see the through both sides of the appearances. The good and the bad. The feeling of connected and disconnected. And you see the common denominator to all that is the seeing and that's the absoluteness. That's the pause. That's the original face in Zen. Yeah? And all the ideas that you have about it will drop off, slough off like old skin off that snake. Yeah? Because I don't know why, but this thing tends to economize you. It can, tends to pair you down. It can, tends to strip you. Yeah? Of what's not essential. And then you're open. You get to need to know. You get to know what you need to know when you need to know it. Not a moment before, and it doesn't linger after. It just downloads. It's applicable, and when it's not applicable, it's it's just the space of it. <laughs> you don't just get a giant treasure trove library. You really don't. You know, I don't. I don't feel that at all. Yeah. If this is the seat assignment, stuff downloads when I'm doing talks. When I'm walking around. It might, it's just spacious, yeah? When I'm here, downloads are come because this is appropriate. If I'm at a place where people don't want to hear it, downloads don't come because it's not appropriate, yeah? It wouldn't do them good. It, wouldn't, it doesn't work. Actually, it could cause them to dis, dis, disease, you yeah? know? They're not ready to deal with it, so why put it in? Yeah? Well, just give them something else to beat themselves up with. I can't see, that's to say, the system always turns everything, even an imitation, into a should, you know. I have to. No one has to do anything or should do anything. It's just an imitation. But the head that hears it turns it into, I have to do this now, or I should do this. And then when you don't, then there's the guilt arises, because it's based on you're the doer of it or not the doer of it. It goes, we keep... Everything gets re-inverted back to the system and given meaning by the system. Every freaking thing. Even a freeing, liberating idea becomes an incarceration. Yeah? Another fucking form of, pris- of slavery. Now you get enslaved to meditation. I have to meditate every day. I've got to work out every day. You know, I've got to get to the gym every day. Who says that? Who's setting the bars up? Who's setting these terms? Yeah? Who's playing God? That's what I love, just being free of it. You know, the, the, the freedom from the bondage of self is just such a... It's an activity. That's all it is. It's an activity just like the freedom, you know, the bondage of self is an activity. You know? Every second, the possibility is there. Bound or unbound. They're both seemingly so. What you truly are is neither. Yeah? What you truly are, if you rest in that you're not either, then you tend to be unbound. <laughs> if you want to be the someone that's unbound, you'll probably be bound quite a lot. <laughs> to have a really nice contrast when you have the experience of being unbound, it'll feel great. It's actually, as an experience, it's much better than constantly being unbound. Really, because then the unbound gets normal. It's just normal. It's not like a big rush. But when you're really been, you know, incarcerated and you're freed, it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah? But to get that rush, it's like an addiction. You've got to get incarcerated again. 
It's like shooting up. So people worry and worry and worry, and then it doesn't happen, and there's this huge flood of relief. What does the mind do? Worry, worry, worry again. It becomes another form of drug. Yeah. I'm so happy that what I was thinking didn't happen. <laughs> so, do you have any, any any questions? What time is it now? We're going to lunch soon, right? Only twelve thirty. Yes. Yeah, I just uh, you probably answered it already, but uh, I need to be specific more about where uh, a little bit more personal for me. Anyways, uh, uh, I, I get a lot of these. I have an understanding of what it is. I don't know how to use them. Anyways, uh, my biggest problem is work. Yeah, uh, I have. Uh, I can't get past the feeling that I have to go to work and that I have to take care of myself. And and etc. Uh, etc. Et and you know, it's, uh, and you're told, well, whatever is supposed to happen is going to happen. And if I go into the office and I don't and I don't perform or whatever the situation is, um, you know, it's not that the outcome isn't good, and, uh, and I kind of like the way things are. You know, so I don't really want them to change in a sense. But well, that's uh, the deal. Well, it's uh, but uh, you know, I. I and I worry, not worry, or I think about my job uh, on, on basically not all weekend long, but quite often. I, I'll go to the, my the computer and do some work for you know. So it's all constantly on my mind, and uh, I don't think I'm the only guy in here that could say you know I, you know, I if I didn't ever have to work again, it wouldn't bother me much. So, uh, but it's um, anyway. So for me, that's my biggest dilemma is that and you. Know, you you basically answered because I'm thinking it up that I'm this person that is a provider and or, or I've got this idea that I'm this and I need to do that to be this and heaven forbid uh, who would like me if I was walking around the streets broke and blah, you know, so I got yeah. all this garbage going on. Well, I think it sounds like you answered your own question, but yeah, yeah. You know. I would always, if you wanted to, you could just throw a self, you know, an inquiry question in there. You could just say, well, who is it that's worrying about all this? Just to pause the mind story telling during the day. Yeah, because it's probably used to, the work is a big storytelling place for it. So, because it has a lot of meaning built in. Society also makes it have a lot of meaning, too. So, it's a fertile petri dish for the mind to get into its little activity. Yeah, so just throw in a question every once in a while. Who is it that's worrying so much? And if you, you know, you could do this thing. This isn't a, an offering this. I think it comes from NLP or something, but I always liked it. Which is, let's say, you're afraid of being destitute. Yeah? So you go, okay, I'm really afraid of being destitute. I'm afraid of losing my job. Yeah, sounds thing. Okay, well, what does it mean? What does losing your job mean to you? Yeah? This is just to check out what ha- the meaning the mind's giving things. Okay, let's say if someone says to me, I don't have a job really, so I'm not afraid of losing it. And I'm, if this is my job, I'm not afraid of losing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but let's just say I have a job and I'm afraid of losing it. Okay? All right, well, what does that mean to me? Well, it means if I lose the job, I won't be able to take care of myself. All right? Okay. All right. What does taking care of yourself mean to you? You won't be able to take care of yourself. Well, I won't be able to... I, I'll have to do something else. I really don't want to do it. You know? I'm used to this place. I don't want to move from where I am. All right. Well, what does that mean to you? That you don't want to do something else? Well, I want things my way. Uh, well, what does that mean to you, that you want things my way? Well, I'll be upset if it doesn't go my way. All right, well, what does that mean to you? Well, that's going to continue not to go my way. Oh, all right. What does that mean to you? Well, it's going to go to the point where I'm really going to be imposed upon. Well, what does that mean to me? I don't like being imposed upon. I feel claustrophobic. Yeah? 
I want to run out or strike out, or strike back. All right, well, what does that mean to you? I'm afraid I won't be taken care of. All right, well, we're getting close enough. Well, what does that mean to you? Uh, well, there's nothing to rely on. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean to me? Well, it's all on me. What does that mean to me? I don't think I'm capable. What does that mean to me? That makes me bad. Ooh, I should be capable. Uh, what does that mean to me? Well, if I'm bad, I don't deserve anything. Hmm, all right. What does that mean to me? Well, if I don't deserve anything, I'm going to be punished. Right. And then you go on and on and on, and after a while, you get to a point where all the meanings will run out, and what was there to begin with will be left with just the space all those meanings are appearing. Mm-hmm. That's what you do. Because you're never upset for the reason you think. The primary dilemma isn't your job. You're never upset for the reason you think. It's a... It's a diagnosis from the cause of miracles. You're never obsessed, upset for the reason you think. So because you're giving meaning to things. So you give the meaning and keep looking at the meaning. And it runs out. And when it runs out, what's left is that space that all the meaning is appearing. So it's always been empty, that space. And you can lead it to the point where it's empty. Yeah, even though you've had all this stuff filling it up. Like just following it, what, what, how, what meaning you're giving things, yeah? You can do it with someone else, and they can take you down. It's like going down a ladder, where there won't be anything there. Yeah? And then you get a hit. If you get keep going there where there's nothing there, you realize there's nothing there. Even though, though there's something always seemingly appearing there, the inherent reality is there's nothing there. That's the great relief from feeling incapable, feeling non-deserving, feeling you deserve to be punished, feeling you fucked up, feeling you're the doer, all those meanings, yes? The freedom is always not to say, you know, to some kind of try to pacify yourself with the meaning still in place, but to realize you're not those meanings, that you're actually what's always been there, the emptiness of the space, that all those meanings are appearing in, yes? They're being held by the mind and giving, and, and giving energy in the space of the mind. The space of the mind never changes. If you take those meanings out, there'll be another problem that will have meanings in, or another thing they will have meanings in, and the meanings and the meanings tend to draw our attention only to the surface meaning. I can't lose my job. Yeah? How are you going to understand what's going on if you're only seeing the consequential level? Yeah? If you're right this close to something, you don't get a good view of it. Yeah? You don't... You know how they do it with those planes? You know, you get the picture of the situation and then you lift up and the more and more you see that you're in a town and then there's just grass and mountains and then there's space and there's the earth and it keeps going and keeps going and you realize how small all of that was that seems so big when you're at that one level. Yeah? Where do you think mind is? It's every one of those levels. It's all the levels. All the levels are appearing in mind. There's, there's no point, there's no higher view than mind, and there's no level level of manifestation that isn't of mind. Yeah? Mind is the overriding principles of all principles. Yeah? So, here you have levels. Of course, your miracles talks about it. level confusion. So someone's on the level of consequences. Shits hit the fan, yeah? The fans are on, the shit's there. There's a lot of fans, a lot of shit, and they're running the gauntlet of the hallway. Shit and fans, yeah? At that point, while they're running the gauntlet, they don't want to be reading a book about there's no shit and no fans. They need like a certain like mask, you know, that like a Teflon mask that when the shit hits, it just drips off, yeah? You know, like shit proof. Shoes and everything and run out like that. Yeah? Then when they got out of the gauntlet or when there's a break, maybe they can read about this is sort of how the gauntlet seems to be so real. Yeah? And maybe just maybe it's not as real as you think it is. <sighs> okay, okay. So next time they're in the gauntlet of shit and fans, they realize, geez, now they see what turns the fan on, they see how the shit aligns. And they see the tendency to go, what's happening? You know, <laughs> with the fan. Okay? So now they don't get hit that much. After a while, they just, 
they're not getting it at all. The mask comes off, the helmet, they don't need the shoes, yeah? And after a while, they're not running the gauntlet anymore, yeah? The gauntlet's still there, the shit and fan is still there, yeah? All the situations, but something happens. The mind has changed, yeah? What we're waiting for here is we're, giving, we're, trying, we're waiting for all the power we've given things to affect us for those things to stop affecting us so much. We don't see our role that we've given them the power that they're having to affect us. You know, we're not, we're refusing, we're adamantly, we want to say that we're, we're powerful and we're empowered, but we don't want to acknowledge the real power that we're the making of this place in a way. We're participating in this event. We're not, we're not been thrust into this event against our wishes and all of these things are happening to us. And you know, we're participating in it. This is our life. This is our living going on. Paul? Yeah. Um, so, through life I'm chasing shiny objects, right? And uh, there came a point where you lose everything to the end of that, which maybe is a perceived starting point of trueness or falseness. And then, is it the self that measures it, good or bad? Well, what else does? Not the self, because there's no self, but it's the mind. And the mind will be giving meaning things to the prism it's looking through. And right now, for most of us, the formatted way we start in a way is self-centeredness, yeah? We grow into it in this event. And the self-centeredness is a certain, uh, has certain lenses with certain colors and a certain aperture. And so we're seeing the world and ourselves and other people and things and everything else through those lenses, yeah? And those lenses are what's allowing are defining the meaning that's being given to things, yes? We're just, we're not changing the idea, or you can't, the idea that mind's giving meaning to things. We're just saying, well, let's look at the lens all this meaning is coming through. And the lens is self-centeredness, yeah? What would happen if the selfing wasn't us, we'd, be, we'd lose interest in that. We may lose interest in the selfing, and then the modality of mind could be accessed a different modality. Instead of self-centeredness, let's say it would be centeredness. And then you would be at the point of distribution of meaning, and yet the meaning would be, it would be like dancing to it, instead of a polka, you'd be dancing to a waltz, let's say. Yeah? You, you, would, things would, see, you would see things anew. Yeah? Or you would respond to things anew. Yeah? Without much thought or effort on your part. All you need to do is acknowledge when it's happening. Honor it. You know, because the head is built on advertising. It's constantly telling you nothing works and this and that, you know. But when, when something does work, honor it, you know. Don't immediately go to the next thing that you, that's going to work. Honor what's working and work. Let it work for a while. Don't add on. Don't pile on. Don't throw more gas in the carburetor. You'll just flood the car. If you hear something and it seems to... Speaking of unspoken yes, why go to a new venue two weeks later or a new modality? Maybe let that thing take root a little bit. Give it a little time. Let it stew. Cook. Yes? Yeah. Instead of, all right, it's time to heat more on. Let's add this addition. We'll add, put a little Kabbalah in and a little Zen, you know, and a little Taoism and a little Hasidic Judaism and Christianity, the old Christian Gnosticism. I mean, after a while, you don't see the... It's like the ornaments. You get stuck on the ornaments once again. I found that's right. That one thing I had, I was lucky. I don't know why. When events would occur to me and when I got introduced to new ideas, I entertained them for a while. I didn't rush to the next one. I sat around and I just... And then just walked around with it, lived, was reading, doing this, and I entertained it. And I gave it a little time instead of, all right, well, let's, let's add something to this. No, you know? Just like in sometimes, it maybe it will work for some people, but now they're trying to make Buddhism into 12 steps and 12 steps into Buddhism, and there's all this fusing of things, yeah? The fusing of this method and that method. Let's mix all these modalities up and make a super modality, Yeah? I see people who, they're, they're out drunks, and they, you try to use Buddhism to become sober, they're just drunk Buddhists, you know? <laughs> they are. 
<laughs> and then alcoholics, they're trying to do Buddhism. It's just like they become too sophisticated for 12 steps now. You know? And they, they, a few years later, they're drinking again, and they're going right down the tubes again. And now they have a big fucking image, an idea. They should know better. Yeah. Give something to, you know, like people will say that with me. Well, why are you still going to the 12 steps? Why not? Works for me. Love the presence. Love the people. They're pretty straightforward, most of them. There's some grace involved in the system. Like that's undeniable. If you look at any groups, there's an undeniable grace in the 12-step program of this world. Undeniable. I've seen more transformations in the 12 steps in any groups, all the groups I've ever inter- got introduced to combined. Yeah? I mean, people, their faces change in a few weeks if they're participating. The lightness that starts showing up, the, the, the weight of anxiety drops. It's just amazing. They get relief. And they, some of them don't even know they're getting the relief, yeah? Because they're sitting there listening to the narration. They're not responding to what's happening. And then people are saying, well, how many meetings should I go to? And you go, well, how about this one? You know? <laughs> just be here. Just attend to this one. Yeah? Don't keep planning ahead. Just go here. Go to this satsang. Yeah? Sit here. Open up to this event. Yeah? Instead of planning on your next event, this event. It's very difficult to stop if you're being forced to march by a thought system that's based on time. It's going to be very hard to pull over to the side. It will. You'll, you'll, be, you'll feel like you're being left behind. All these weird ideas will come over you. You're going to be missing something. You're not in step. Yeah, someone's going to get ahead of you. You're not going to get it. Yeah, i got to work harder. All this is based on time. All those feelings that are manipulated by the mind through the prism of self-centeredness based on this idea of time. That you're longing and you've missed something and I should have got it earlier. They're all fucking crazy ideas. They're like sticking needles in your ass all day and then sitting. <laughs> You're just adding pain upon pain. It's freaking crazy. It is. And then it's justified for some crazy idea that you, you think it's true, that I should have gotten this earlier. You probably would have blown up if you ever heard this message 20 years ago. Yeah? You would have said, I know this and never even entertained it again. I know it. It's nothing. It doesn't. Exactly. And then you would have thought nothing is really nothing and you would never entertain it again. Everything has its time and place. It's beautiful. And the thing is, if you entertain this idea, you won't think you've ever missed anything. You realize there wasn't you to miss anything and none of that actually ever happened. So, you were not late to the party. (laughs) The the bus didn't, you didn't miss the bus. (laughs) Now you have to wait for the next bus to come? No. That waiting is the bus. Yeah. The bus is the bus stop. The bus is the driver, you, the other passenger. It's the waiting for it always is the same bus. It's always the same opportunity. You are there. What you're looking for is what's looking. What's looking for the bus to come, that's what's looking. That's what you're looking for. Not the bus. You're looking for what's looking for the bus to come. And that's what? Where you are. The head, the head, the mental system of selfing is attempting to disperse. I don't know why, but it, that maybe it's not even attempting to. It disperses your interest and attention to the farthest areas of space and time. Different places, different memories of different things. Just so that you're bereft of your most valuable quality, which is interest and attention right now. You don't have the interest and attention enough to entertain what's here. Because it's been dispersed by this slavery to time and events and things. Yeah? So, my whole system is is back-weighted in the past and then projecting over this moment through this, because this is all that's happening, through this a moment to an imaginary future. And uh, attention's dispersed. So you really like to be here, and you cannot not be here, but your attention and interest, which would enrich the experience of being here, is 
beholden to there and then. That's not slavery? I don't know what is. I don't know what is. What is what could that be but other than slavery? When they, in a sense, you don't even have the ability to call it back. You can't call your attention. Do you think this is going to bring all that attention back? <laughs> your attention's beholden to that. That's what's remembering self. That's what's remembering self. They're on a job. They've been enslaved to a purpose, a mental little tyranny. A mental tyranny is, is occupying the White House, in a sense. Yeah. They're doing their job. Let's think about Paul in the past. Let's think about Paul in the future. So there's a feeling of being Paul now. That's what's going on. If you were free from the past and the future, I tell you, it wouldn't be a you to be free from it. You wouldn't be feeling like Paul's free from the past and the future. Paul is the past and the future. <laughs> You'd be free from that Paul, that idea of Paul. Seriously, you would. That's why you you would sense the lacking of Paul, the lacking of Tanya. That would be the that's the incredible presence. It's the exact. It's correlated. Your presence as Paul is the absence of what so the seeming absence. It can't be absent, but it can seem to be absence to you and me. Yeah. When this be, when this seeming presence is seen to be truly absent, which it is inherently, then the presence that was always there gets acknowledged by our experience. And when that happens, you realize that's what you were looking for. You weren't thinking it was that, but when you when that uh, hits you, you realize that's what I was looking for. Just being freed from all this. Milwaukee going on. Yeah. So, <coughs> there any more questions? I think I owe everyone 10 minutes from last night. Why aren't I late? Half <laughs> <laughs> I want everyone to be happy they got enough for their money. Yeah. <laughs> I spent four hours. I should have gotten it by now. <laughs> <laughs> If it was only that easy, how can you construct a solution to, of, of timelessness in time? How can you put the solution, which is timelessness, timeless, under the constraints of time in any way? Do you think it's going to put up with that? Do you see how many people have vlogged thousands of hours and it seems not to have dawned on them? And then someone walks in and gets it like that. You ever hear the parable of, of Jesus? I don't know if you meant this or not, but it's about that. The guy's looking for some workers for the day, and he goes to like the union hall. They didn't have union halls back then, but let's just say the union hall. And he sees some guys, and he says, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks an hour, work on my place, you know? It's like 8.30, so they go there. And then he goes back to the union hall, the, the guy, and he, says, and he looks for people, and, uh, no, he says, I'll give you, he gives, says the guy at 8 30 morning, I'll give you 50 bucks to work the day. All right? So the guy says, yeah, 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 and he hires some people. Then at 12 o'clock, he goes back and he says, he hires some more people for 50 bucks for the rest of the day. And then he goes back around 3 30 and he hires 50 bucks, people for 50 bucks for the rest of the day. Now, the people that have been there at, since 8 o'clock get really pissed off. Because I'm getting 50 bucks a day. I'm working eight hours. This guy came in at 12. He's working four hours to get 50 bucks. And this guy just came at 3.30. He's going to get 50 bucks. Yeah? They're all freaking flipped out. But the fact is, timelessness. Yeah? It's the same. The same 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3.30 when it comes to timelessness. The person's received the message when they received it, and they got it. Yeah? Someone said they thought they, they had a they had a they worked at eight till four. The others got there at three thirty. Yeah. <clears throat> the first shall be last. The last shall be first. What do you think he's fucking with? This whole idea of time. Yeah. What about the prodigal son? You ever hear about the prodigal son where the guy he's in a pretty nice situation, has a nice family and his brother and stuff, and he goes out, gets loaded, and he starts gambling and gets into a lot of trouble and he ends up totally destitute but every time he feels like he wants to surrender he just thinks he's 
you know, like those meaning he was given things. He thinks he's too bad. He basically, in a sense, deserves his situation. So he ends up in a pigsty, just chewing like corn cobs with the pigs. And they just had enough. He gets sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he just drops it and says, I surrender. And I said, and he wants to go back. And as soon as, suddenly, the story seemingly ends there. And it immediately starts up that he meets his father on the road. His father gives him a nice bit of clothing, puts a ring on him, says, hey, we're having a big feast. Let's go. Yeah? Exactly. I don't get the story. Oh, you don't get the story? I never got the story. Oh, no? Well, the thing is, there the guy is. He was, he, it was on him. He could have been free at any moment. The requirements oh, was on his side, the son. As soon as he just surrendered and gave up his opinions about himself and his situation, that father was there immediately, giving him the robe and the ring, and he had a big feast. That feast could have happened the, the first night he went out, or the 30th day, or the four years later. It's just like the idea of heaven's door, yeah? There was a little story about heaven's door. So let's say... I feel like I want to go to heaven. So I go to heaven's door, and I knock on heaven's door. Knock, 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 knock. And then God, it seems so fast, too. The door opens, like, immediately. <laughs> Where was he? I thought he, could have been in, I thought he was in the back of heaven, but he's right there. And then I go, and God, it's God. And he goes, and I go, can I come in? You know, I want to go to heaven. And God looks right at me and goes, Paul can't come in. So I get, I sort of get a little dejected, and I go back, and I start practicing, and I start thinking, I start doing what I think will get me into heaven, you know, a lot of meditation, doing service, and stuff like that. And I feel like after 10 years, I got a pretty good resume, you know, and I went to all these retreats. My spiritual experiences have been notarized by great lineage holders, you know, so, you know Chinese print block, you know, so he's, he's understood something. All right. So now I go back, knock on the door. And immediately, it always throws me for a loop so fast. You know, yeah, the door opens. What the hell? Are you waiting right behind the door? So <laughs> then, <laughs> I go, God, can I come in? And God goes, uh, Paul, can't come in. And now, instead of going back and practicing, I say, fine, screw this. I'm just going to get loaded. So I start, I just go back out and party and go crazy and just fornicate, run around, and everything. And then uh, get really beat up and I get caught up in the currents of life and I get washed up one day, right near the door of, of heaven. And uh, when I'm standing up out of the water, I, something happens. My mind shifts. And I knock on the door. And immediately that same feeling comes over me. He's so there, right there. And it says, I look at God, and I say, can I come in? And God says, Paul can't come in. And I walk right in, yeah? Because mm-hmm. I finally realize I'm not Paul, yeah? Mm-hmm. It wasn't personal. He wasn't saying, I can't come in. Paul can't come in. He was just saying, Paul, Steve, Mary, Jim can't come in. Any mind identified as this idea of self can't enter the kingdom of heaven. It's too big, it's too It's too small for it. So, do you ever have any doubt? Do you ever About wake what? up and think, I'm living wrong, I made a mistake? Like the whole future thing? No, I had that when I'd eaten boo, bad food. <laughs> I ate at the Sharma restaurant. I was wondering, did I make a mistake? With that? So, a little trouble in the digestion. That could happen, but no, not about that. No, no, really. But I, yeah, so I noticed I made mistakes, but not that. No, I make mistakes all day. My head's telling me this is a mistake coming to Toronto. Yeah, it does all the time. My head does does what it does. It's gotten much chilled out, but it still it still has this basic theme because it's sort of like a, it's just been relegated to a, like a soundproof room. It still uses this megaphone, thinking it's reverberating through the corporation of Paul. But it's just, <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get killed, or you know, but nothing. Really it's, it's, but that's its nature. It's just the way it is. Well, there's a difference. You hear it, but you don't listen to it. It's difference. Hearing it because you're conscious. You cannot not hear it. Sounds are coming. They're being noted. And there's a hearing of it. You, you, you hear thoughts in a way, yeah? So that hearing occurs. <coughs> but actually, a lot of it goes away because the, it's the keen interest that causes you to really listen, yeah? So when the, when the interest... And the interest is rooted in it's about you, basically. And if you entertain that the system of thought isn't about you, you'll lose interest in the thought system. That's what happens. And as as the interest gets more and more lost, well, obviously that's the that's the correlation with the immunity to the thoughts. Yeah. And then you're now 
being navigated by other you know, movements of mind and other things. Yeah? And then it stabilizes, and then you know you get to know the tree by the fruits. You see the relief, and then you get to realize what the problem was. And then it echoes some of the, the truth of some of the statements I heard. They were on the money about the root of the problem. I heard, I learned about the root of the problem, some of it in recovery, but I think they didn't really get to the real root. I thought they got it to, they got close, which was obsession with self. But I believe that's what the mind does to reinforce the idea of being a self. So the mental process to keep reinforcing the identification as self has to obsess over the idea of being a self. Because it has to keep gluing the mind to this crazy idea that it's a long-lasting independent separate entity. It can't. And it's a very... It never holds, so the glue has to be applied like a lot of the day. Yeah? Like that. Yeah. So once it was seen... And then the download, I had, I hadn't, I heard about that, that message, that it may be, I didn't, that you're not a self, I heard about it, but it never really rang super true until it downloaded, you know, something occurred, and then when I read it, then it had real meat, and I saw that it was a foreign installment, you know, that this was like, almost like a helmet we're wearing, this thought system. You ever see those dogs when they have mange, they put those plastic things on so they can't itch or something? It's like every a lot of people have just got a little like satellite dish just picking up ID my all day. You know, it's just incredible. And you know, like that antenna I had in my head. It's just like a new antenna gets placed and it picks up different stations. The K Paul is like the golden oldie station, you know what I mean? <laughs> this is what it was, this is how it's gonna be. You better worry about this. Buy this fucking insurance policy. <laughs> 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 you know, and then something changes, and then you'll know it when it changes, you know, because it's going to express the changes. What happens has to express here. This is this is a place of manifestation. What's manifestation but expression? Yeah. So when the mind changes, it's got this opportunity here to express the changes, and it's going to. Yeah, and you're going to be the depository of that. It's going to happen as you through this interface. And you're going to sense it. And then, hopefully, in that sensing it, you'll intimate where it's coming from, which is something that can't be seen or felt or heard or tasted, but it can be intimated. Yeah, you will sense it. Yeah. And it's just, uh, it's just sort of like that touch, you know? When I used to shoot drugs, I used to shoot coke a lot, and there was points where if I shot coke, there'd be a point I would be leaving the body, yeah? I'd be going off. Gone. And I, I, I found out that if someone just came and put their hand on my shoulder, it would keep me here. Yeah? This is sort of like that, that, that lovely hand on the shoulder all day, this presence. It has a great, uh, yeah, it's just this, it's just, it's like a, a loving presence that's omnipresent. Yeah, it's always there. Yeah. So while there's no no arrival from the past or to the future, to the present, because when you're there, you're still here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is, that's just the storyline here, obviously, you know. If there was a past, then... Um, You'd be feeling it, seeing it, hearing it, tasting it, and touching it. Yeah. You'd be consciously engaged with it. The only moment of time you're engaged with is now. Yeah. You're not engaged with next week's moment of time, are you? Really? You're not seeing it, hearing it, feeling it, tasting it. You can only envision it by thought, right? And you're not engaged with a past moment of time. Only one one modality of consciousness, the thinking, is, is available to that. Yeah? So you have to see how thinking's dominating this experience. If it's if it's what it can only experience, which is the thought system, if that's the dominant experience here, then I would say that's the dominant system. So if I'm not seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting, and actually, how many people even smell much anymore, you know? I mean, all those flowers and how many of them smelled by people. 
when you walk into work and stuff, and, you know, not much, but all those thoughts that are be attending, that are being attended to, you have to see it's a real imbalance in the whole ex- what's going on here. All this consciousness moving through these six gates, and the one gate is the main thoroughfare, the, the gate of mind, mind minutia. And it's way top heavy, it's way overloaded, yeah? If you're ro- rooted here, that, that, uh, that, uh, the flow, there'll be more emphasis on seeing, hearing, feeling, tasting. Like even after the talks, I bet you, you'll taste, the food will taste a lot different sometimes, yeah? Your senses get heightened, yeah? That's just because the distribution has changed. Yeah, more attention is going into the other gate through the other gates. So you hear, like sometimes I hear music and it's so fucking unbelievable. Yeah, when you go out here, babbling brook and something, because you've got there's attention that's freed from this uh, this slavery, and it can pay attention to other gates, which the invitations are much different than the thought system. Really, they are. They're incredibly different. Some vistas you get to see, this feel of wind the sound of it through trees like evergreens and stuff different trees play differently it's just beautiful it's just unbelievable intoxicating in a way but many of us don't have the attention and interest uh, there to uh, to uh, invest in that yeah because it's all up here it's all about worrying what's going to happen to me you know or what did happen to me and dwelling over and over on things how many times do you dwell on something you smelled about? How many times do you go back to that smell? Not many, but how many times do you go back to thoughts about a day that happened five years ago? Maybe thousands of times the mind goes there. Yeah? Maybe how many times has the mind gone to the future? Concerns. Millions of times. Yeah? Do you remember that first note of that, well, uh, like, uh, the first note played by Jimi Hendrix you ever heard? No, probably not so much. You know? Well, you ever remember A Whole Lot of Love with Led Zeppelin? If you were my age. That second album? That was a mind-boggling uh, recording, you know, back then. The Whole Lot of Love and the woo It's unbelievable, you know? Unbelievable what was going on. But then thoughts get fucking replayed constantly over and over and over again. You got to see it. You know, if you see the situation, then it puts value on the solution. You know, you may be keen on the solution if you see the dilemma, and maybe it would be nice if, hey, how much feeling do you do? You know, touch it. You know, touch like a, a puppy's hair or a kids. Like I love uh, kids' heads. You know, little babies' heads. Just like a little shake on them. They're great. A little hand. You know, and, you know all that. How much? How much emphasis is on the feeling? You know, all this has been subtract. You know, when we were kids, there was a lot of emphasis going on, feeling things, finding out. We found out by feeling. Everyone wanted to put something in their mouth. This is how we found out. Really, that's how you knew things then, right? So what happened? Well, got sucked up here. <laughs> really, it's so cerebral now. It's just way up there. And now it seems the hard to get it to flow back, isn't it? It gets it captured in a way. And then it just and then what does it do? Now there's too there's way too much attention to to the thoughts. They have too much influence and sway. They can change a day that's so beautiful and make it feel bleak because you're worrying about two weeks from now. That's a powerful mind there, isn't it? That it could have one, it could entertain one thought that could cause it not to entertain the sunny day. Here. And how many times does it get away with that? Quite a lot. You don't see that as a slavery? To me? Don't, you don't see that as a heist? Like a, like a robbery? A robbery? I don't even know. I'm, a, I'm so concerned about my house getting robbed, it's already been robbed. I'm already bereft of a lot of, a lot of my value. And I'm worrying about someone breaking into my house. I've already been stripped of a lot of things. Sucked up in here. Because where does selfing abide? It abides in the mental realm. And where does selfing appear? It appears in time. It's not appearing here. No one's seeing the self here. 
You're seeing bodies. You're not seeing anything that gets close to itself. Yeah? It abides in time. For it to have relevance, it has to be seen in time and in the mind. Therefore, fuck the feeling, fuck the seeing, fuck the hearing, fuck the tasting. Let's get up here. And let's think about what we saw. Let's think about what we tasted once. Let's think about what we felt. Let's think about what we smelled. You know, you know how it is. You know, in the sunset, you see the sunset, and then you immediately compare it to a past sunset. Yeah, it sort of ruins the day. Oh, this sunset's really, but it's not as nice as the one I saw in Bali. Oh, okay. Screw the sunset. It never measures up. This world, this girl's really nice, but she's not like my first love. Of course, she's not like she's your first love. She's alive. You know, your first loves died. They left a long time ago. But I, I want her to be like no. You know, where does this come from? And to be so dominated by it, I just see it as a slavery. I just, uh, and I'm, I'm just tired of it. You know, and uh, I'm, I'm really happy the grace showed up that I could hear something that finally, the click of the opening of the, of the fake bondage, man, is, it was an unspoken yes. I just knew it. I just knew this is what I needed to hear. When I heard it, you know, that I'm not that. That's that. (laughs) And we'll go to lunch, yeah?